Hello everyone, this is Mr. Ho here. Um, so as all, your, all of you know that the typhoon has been very destructive. Um, it ruins the street, but I tell you what guys, it can ruin our city, it can rough our city up, but it can never destroy our teaching plan. So that's why I'm here today filming a video for the two classes where we're supposed to have. And hopefully you guys uh, can go through this video and uh, learn something and probably I'm not going to talk about this anymore so you guys please treat this video as a regular lesson just treat it as a an innovative online lesson and that's why I'm using English right now okay now let's get started if you have your notes on your hand the redox part one please go to page 20 please go to page 20 all right now if you don't have your notes at your hand don't worry I have attached a link on the description below where you can find part of the notes pertaining to the class today. All right? So you can uh, pause the video and go download that video if you wish, um, and then you resume the lesson. All right? So let's get started. Page 20. Page 20. Now, before we talk about something called oxidizing agent and reducing agent. So Remember that for oxidizing agent, oxidizing agent, it actually undergoes reduction. It undergoes reduction. Whereas on the other hand, reducing agent, they undergo reduction. Okay, it's kind of a counterintuitive, but remember that um, agent is like a helper. So it helps something out. So an oxidizing agent helps others to undergo oxidation. That's why it's called oxidizing agent. And how does it help others to undergo oxidation? Well, it helps by undergo reduction itself. Okay? It helps others to undergo oxidation by undergoing reduction itself. Same idea applies to reducing agents. If you want to help others to undergo reduction, then you must undergo oxidation by itself, all right? So that's the idea. Now, we also talk about the um, properties. We can describe a reagent. If it is an oxidizing agent, then we say it has oxidizing properties, okay? It has oxidizing properties. So an oxidizing agent will have oxidizing property, okay? Just another name talking about very similar stuff, oxidizing property. So reducing agents will have reducing property, okay? So just another name, right? And later on, when we want to look at the strength of oxidizing agents and reducing agents, then let's just say we have an oxidizing agent that is so strong that can oxidize almost everything then we say that it has a very strong oxidizing power, oxidizing power, or simply we say it is very oxidizing. And same idea for reducing agent. If that is very reducing, then we will say that it has a strong reducing ability or strong reducing power or simply very reducing, all right? Now, for this part that we are focusing on are actually acids, okay? And especially we look at the oxidizing properties. Now, if you think back to Form 4, when we talk about acid and base, we introduce some very common acids such as HCl, HSO4, nitric acid. But if you notice that for most of the cases when we are dealing with those acids, those acids are diluted, diluted. Not sure if you notice. The reason why they are used, they are, uh, they are referred to by the diluted form is because their concentrated form actually react differently okay and that's why today we are going to look at how concentrated acid reacts does it only have an acid property that that means does it only react with base does it only undergo neutralization well in fact there are something more to that so let's look into it now for concentrated sulfuric acid um, one thing you have to bear in mind is when it comes to concentrate, you may ask how con it is to be concentrate. Now, this one is not necessary. Like, let's say it reached that point that it is considered as concentrated sulfuric acid. 
This is just give you a, a ballpark value. What do you mean by concentrated sulfuric acid? And that is also reflecting the reality. Like if you purchase a concentrated sulfuric acid, that's gonna be the concentration it, it will be, all right? So for concentrated sulfuric acid, not only being very concentrated, and actually if you look at the percentage by mass, if you look at the percentage by mass, basically it is almost H2SO4 with very little water, just enough to exhibit its acidic property. Um, so that's why when we write the formula of H2SO4, we will use liquid state instead of AQ. All right? So in other words, when you look at a, a, a chemical, a sulfuric acid, you notice that we use liquid to state the physical state, then you already know we are talking about concentrated sulfuric acid, all right? Now, properties, we have three properties. So first of all, hygroscopic property. Kind of talk about this when we talk about primary standard, when we talk about why sodium hydroxide solid is not a primary standard. Um, the reason because is it will absorb moisture from the air so it will become less pure. Now for concentrated sulfuric acid, it will readily absorb atmospheric moisture and dilute itself. So this is often the reason why when you purchase a concentrated sulfuric acid, it is often more diluted as what it has stated on the label. Obviously because it absorbs water and dilutes itself. Now for dehydrating property, for dehydrating property, based on the name you can tell, it's about removing water. Now if you look at the definition, we said that it can remove water from a chemical compound. Um, first of all, you may ask, um, this one I have to put it down on here. So you may ask, what is drying properties versus dehydrating property? Like for these two properties, looks like they are the same, right? Both of them are removing water. But what exactly is the difference? Well, the difference is that for drying properties, we are removing water that is not chemically joined to the compound. So for example, you have a sodium chloride solid, but uh, it is wet, it's not dry enough. You haven't put it into an oven. So in that case, a drying agent may be useful, but uh, dehydrating property, they do not remove water that is not chemically joined. In fact, it is even more powerful. It removes water that is chemically joined into the compound, right? It is part of the compound, usually covalently bond. And this dehydrating agent is breaking that bond down, changing it into water, and um, basically remove it from the compound via a chemical reaction, all right? So that is the difference. So we can put down drying properties. Um, H2O removed it. Is not chemically joined. Whereas this one, H2O removed it, is chemically joined. Right, or basically you can tell is this one is a physical change and this one is a chemical change right because this one it really involves a chemical reaction it really involves breaking some bonds so this is more powerful as you can tell right so going back to the sulfuric acid if you look at this uh, example now, if you have a, a, a sugar cube, a glucose like this, not necessarily glucose, could be um, most of the different sugar. Um, if you have concentrated sulfuric acid, what it does is it will remove the water from it and ends up with elemental carbon and water. So you see this is how it removes water from the glucose. You see, it's not really water that is uh, exist in the sugar, you can tell, right? Um, but it simply breaks the bond and then they form water as the product, as one of the products, okay? So this is dehydrating property. When it comes to experiment, you can easily find videos 
related to the experiment in, uh, in, in YouTube. Um, basically, when you add the sulfuric acid into the sugar, then with this reaction taking place, you expect a, a black solid coming out, which is basically carbon. And this one, because of the heat that is re released, this is a uh, highly exothermic, highly exothermic. That means you release a lot of heat. Then, in fact, you will see some steam, come, uh, some mist, white mist, which is actually steam because it's uh, so hot in this reaction that you actually see some white mist, which is the water. And also you will expect this uh, solid expand because again, with a high temperature, the air trapped inside tends to expand uh, rather like a bread dough, okay? but it's black in color. Okay? But don't try this at home, it's very dangerous. Now, um, for the third property, which is the most important one, is the oxidizing property. Um, concentrated sulfuric acid has a very, not really strong, but uh, it has an oxidizing pro property, especially when heated. Okay, So hot concentrated sulfuric acid has an oxidizing property, that means it's an oxidizing agent. Um, this is the uh, ionic half equation for the uh, oxidation, uh, sorry, for the reduction of concentrated sulfuric acid. Remember, concentrated sulfuric acid is an oxidizing agent. That means it undergoes reduction. As you can see here, sulfur in a sulfuric acid is positive 6, whereas this SO2 that it forms is actually positive 4. So this is a reduction, as you can tell. And um, if you look at the half equation, it, it produces this sulfur dioxide, and which is very important in the later part of the discussion, because sulfur dioxide is an acidic gas, as well as also a reducing agent. Okay, So let me put it down. This one, first of all, is an acidic gas, and secondly, it is a reducing agent. So later on, we will talk about this too, acidic gas and uh, reducing agent. It helps us to uh, test for the presence of sulfuric, uh, sulfur dioxide, okay? based on these two properties. Now, if you look at the reaction, um, if you look at some of the non-metals, are, these are just some examples. Uh, you can see that because it's concentrated sulfuric acid, they are uh, oxidizing agents. They basically oxidize the elements. So for carbon, it oxidizes into uh, carbon dioxide. For sulfur, it oxidizes into sulfur dioxide. Okay. In both situations, they produce SO2 because if you look at the uh, ionic half equation, SO2 should be produced. You can work out the... Um, I only have the equation for both oxidation and reduction by yourself. It, it should be a good practice. Okay. Now, we go to the opposite side. Now, this part is where the um, tedious stuff kicks in. Um, reaction between concentrated sulfuric acid and halides. Now, halides basically means um, X minus, X minus. So it, it basically means Cl minus, uh, and Br minus, uh, I minus, etc. Okay. Usually we don't consider F minus for, for some reason. Okay. Um, so for example, we have these um, very common sodium halides, and we look at the reaction. In fact, for chloride, bromide, and iodide, they have different reaction when it reacts with concentrated sulfuric acid. Now, for sodium chloride, in fact, they will react according to this equation and it will produce HCl gas as the product, as one of the products. And this HCl, you see, is, um, is a gas because, first of all, the concentrated sulfuric acid does not have a lot of water, so the HCl cannot dissolve pretty well in that 2% of water. And second of all, it is highly exothermic, so very properly, the HCl will become a gas and, put, and kind of escape from the reaction mixture. Now, we will see steamy fume of HCl being produced, which is a very important observation. Now, if you want to further um, 
verify the identity of HCL gas, there is a very common test. This is to react this gas with ammonia gas, with ammonia gas. So how do we exactly do it? Now, if you look at this diagram, um, so we have the sodium chloride here, and then we add the sulfuric acid, and we also prepare uh, a reagent bottle of concentrated ammonia solution. Now, for concentrated ammonia solution, it will produce a lot of ammonia vapor, right? But it is stoppered, so they are trapped here because ammonia is very volatile. Now, when the HCl steam, uh, steamy fume are produced, you open up the ammonia bottle, allowing the ammonia gas to flush out. And when the two gases interacting with each other, they will form ammonium chloride, which is an ionic compound. Right? And an ionic compound tends to be solid. But since they are formed between the two gas, it turns out to, um, to, to look like a dense white fume. Okay? Consists of ammonium chloride, some HCl, and ammonia. Right? So this is a verification test for the production of HCl gas. All right? So this is the reaction, very simple. Now notice that this is not a redox reaction. If you're not sure, you can check each uh, oxidation number, you realize that there is no change in oxidation number, all right? Now for bromide, for bromide, um, the reaction is a little bit different because first of all, it is a redox reaction. Um, in, if you look at this reaction, you see, um, first of all, it reacts the same way as sodium chloride. So basically, the, the, it becomes HBr gas, but uh, almost immediately, the HBr gas is further oxidized, further oxidized. So you can put it down here. This is not a redox, not a redox, but this is a redox. Okay, this is a redox reaction. As you can tell from the change in oxidation number, Br minus, okay, bearing a negative one oxidation number, now becomes zero. So we said that the Br minus is oxidized into Br2. All right? Again, concentra concentrated sulfuric acid is an oxidizing agent, so it oxidized the Br minus into Br2. Um, that's why you will see some Br2 gas. Now, bear in mind, Br2 by itself is a brown, is a brown liquid, but again, the reaction is very exothermic, then you actually see some brown vapor, which is the bromine gas. Okay, this is what you expect to see. Okay. Now for iodide, for iodide, um, again they undergo the same reaction as before, but then again HI will be further oxidized. Now pay attention. This time, even though I minus is still being oxidized into I two. All right. But if you look at the, the one with bromide, the difference is here. The difference is here. You see the, 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 the sulfur containing species that is produced after the reaction is different. Now, <clears throat> despite the fact that for both reaction, both conversion, they are reduction, uh, you can find out the oxidation number easily. This is again positive six, positive six, this is um, positive 4, obviously reduction, and this is even lower, negative 2. <clears throat> All right? So even though both situations are reduction, but uh, you may ask why there is a difference, why there is a difference. Well, the reason is because <clears throat> we said that I minus, I minus, and Br minus, okay? When you look at this too, we said that I minus is a stronger reducing agent than Br minus. Okay, it's a stronger reducing agent. So I minus has a stronger reducing ability when compared to Br minus. So <clears throat> that means 
I minus can reduce the sulfuric acid to a greater extent. So I minus can reduce the sulfuric acid to a greater extent, not only to sulfur dioxide, but in fact I minus can further reduce the sulfur dioxide all the way to H2S. Right? And you realize that S is the maximum. Um, it's, it's, it's the lowest oxidation state sulfur can attain. It can never go beyond negative 2, it can never go negative 3 because of the um, number of outermost shell electrons. So I- is so strong that it can reduce sulfuric acid all the way to its lower, ox lowest oxidation number, negative 2. Meaning that I- is you know, stronger reducing agent. And in fact, if you understand this one, if you go back to uh, the chloride one, you see the reason why <coughs> chloride, or oh, this is not a redox reaction, is because, excuse me, <coughs> so the reason why chloride is not being reduced to, um, oh, sorry, it's not being oxidized, is because chloride is such a weak reducing agent so weak that the sulfuric acid is not powerful enough to oxidize it. Now the idea is, um, if you have a strong oxidizing agent pairs with a strong reducing agent, then the reaction will be very fast, very vigorous. Then the oxidizing agent will undergo reduction extensively, probably reaching its, um, you know, the lowest oxidation number possible, whereas the very strong reducing agent will oxidize very extensively and reaching its highest oxidation number possible. All right? This is the case with a strong oxidizing agent and strong reducing agent. But if one of them does not comply, one of them does not comply, such as in this case, even though sulfuric acid kind of strong, but chloride minus is not a good reducing agent. So you see, they cannot actually undergo a redox reaction. All right? So We'll talk more about this later, but now you have some idea that the, the strength of oxidizing power and reducing power actually plays a role determining how the reaction takes take place, right? <clears throat> now, another very important, in fact, I would say this is the most important reaction. See here, I put a star here. Most important reaction is the reaction between concentrated sulfuric acid and copper. Copper. Now, the reaction, we have two uh, ways of writing it. Uh, we can say it forms copper oxide and then sulfur dioxide H2O. Or we can say it forms copper sulfate. Copper sulfate. Now, if you notice that for both situations, um, copper is oxidized to positive 2. Okay? So, <coughs> uh, you may ask why there are two ways of writing it. In fact, the first one is more preferable because uh, looking at the fact that sulfur, uh, sorry, sul uh, sulfuric acid has so little, so few water that it does not able to solvate the copper sulfate aqueous. So in fact, um, copper is oxidized into copper oxide and um, does not dissolve in water because it's so few water available. Okay. So uh, myself, I prefer the first one, but um, again, it doesn't matter which one you choose. Now, if you look at the experiment, um, notice that it must be hot. Huh? It must be hot. Look at here, hot. So bear in mind, if there is cold, no reaction. No reaction between copper and cold concentrated sulfuric acid. Now. In this reaction, this is the copper strip, reddish brown solid, and then the concentrated sulfuric acid we heat it with the Bunsen flame, and um, and then you see that it should become black because of the presence of uh, copper two oxide, which is a black solid suspending in the solution. Okay, so bear in mind it's not the solution that becomes black; it is basically the suspending black solid that makes it black. Okay, the solution itself still colorless. Okay. Um, you also notice that <coughs> we put a, 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 an orange paper at the, at, the, at the mouth of the test tube. This is actually soaked with acidified potassium dichromate. 
solution. Uh, if you remember this one is basically orange in color um, and you also remember that this one this one is actually an oxidizing agent an oxidizing agent okay it's an oxidizing agent if you rem if you don't remember you can go back to your previous page this is a very common oxidizing agent and I ask you guys to memorize the color that's why it's a co very common test um, so when an oxidizing agent come across with a reducing agent, obviously reaction take place. And we remember that when a dichromic undergoes reduction, then it will become chromium three ion, which is green in color. So if you see, so you see that it becomes green in color. That means some <coughs> reducing agent must be produced during this reaction. Now, what reducing agent are we, are we talking about? So if you remember on the previous page, you see, sulfur dioxide is the gas, not only acidic, but also a reducing agent. All right? So that's why uh, we use a dichromic paper to test for the production of sulfur dioxide gas. The change in color kind of um, rarefied that SO2 is being produced. Okay. Now, so here are the observation: reddish brown uh, copper dissolves to form black copper two oxide. Um, the sulfur dioxide gas is colorless, so you don't you, you don't really say colorless gas produced. And um, as a matter of fact, that we will boil it into uh, I mean we will heat it to boiling. That's why you cannot really say that colorless bubble produced because it is already boiling. You cannot tell whether it's a colorless bubble or simply the water boiling or the acid is boiling. Um, but then you can use, like if you use a dichromic paper, you can mention about the color change. Okay, so here SO2 is a reducing agent. Okay, bear this in mind. All right, so um, that's it for the sulfuric uh, acid, concentrate sulfuric acid. Now let's move on to another pain in the butt part which is nitric acid nitric acid now you notice that HCl uh, concentrated HCl is uh, not really oxidizing so we are not going to mention about HCl but nitric acid is known to be very oxidizing very oxidizing and in fact diluted nitric acid and concentrated nitric acid both both are oxidizing okay but to a different extent so let's look into it um, First, we look at the reaction with metal. Now, we try to use um, two different metals. One is magnesium, one is copper, to illustrate the, um, the, 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 the properties. And we also look at three different concentrations of nitric acid. We look at very dilute nitric acid, dilute nitric acid, and concentrated nitric acid. Um, you may ask, what do you mean by very dilute? What do you mean by uh, dilute? Um, again, a ballpark value. Don't take it too seriously. Um, this one is around 0 0.1 amp. This is around 1 amp. Okay? Around. Okay? But uh, if in the exam they uh, try to ask you about uh, the difference in the reaction, they will state explicitly that one is very diluted nitric acid, another one is dilute nitric acid. They don't want to have confusion. Alright? So don't, don't don't have to be worried. Now, if you look at the reaction, so for very dilute nitric acid, you see it reacts with mag magnesium to form a salt and hydrogen gas, and kind of learned about this before. This is simply an acid-base reaction, an acid-base reaction. So it produces a salt and hydrogen gas, basically metal and acid, metal and acid. Okay. So you see the property exhibited is acidic property. Now for copper, no reaction, no reaction, because you know that copper is such an inert, not reactive metal. It does not react with acid at all. Um, I mean the dilute acid. So very dilute nitric acid actually does not have any oxidizing property, no oxidizing property. Okay, so it simply behaves like a dilute hydrochloric acid. Therefore, copper does not react with uh, dilute acid. Okay, so no reaction, no property is exhibited. 
Now for dilute nitric acid, it has oxidizing property. Okay, so even dilute nitric acid oxidizes something is an oxidizing agent. Now, if you look at the reaction, wow, very complicated, very complicated. Um, first of all, we look at the product that is formed. The product that is formed. Um, if you look at, let's say, the reaction with copper, they are basically the same, right? If you look at the reaction here, so first of all, copper is obviously oxidized into copper two ions, copper two ions. And if you look at the nitric acid, an N here, it is positive five, right? And this is um, reduced into positive two, okay? It is reduced into uh, here, positive two, okay? Um, bear in mind that this nitrate ion actually is not uh, either oxidized or reduced, just a spectator ion, and also produce water. Okay. Now, if you look at this diagram, uh, you can see how the reaction takes place and the uh, observ observable change. With the dilute acid and copper, um, so first of all, you see some colorless bubble because of the uh, nitrogen monoxide being produced, NO. This is NO gas. Now, nitrogen monoxide is not soluble in water. Not soluble in water. So that's why it forms a um, colorless bubble. And um, you know that copper 2 nitrate should be blue in color. Uh, sorry, uh, why the solution turns blue? It is because the reaction produced copper to nitrate, which is blue in color. So you also notice the color change from colorless to blue. And at the top, you see there is a faint layer of gas. This is gas, okay? This is gas. Now, this is nitrogen dioxide, NO2, okay? Now, the idea goes like this. Nitrogen monoxide is a colorless gas, not soluble in water, so it will go, uh, it will leave the water layer very quickly. But this NO2, this NO2 is also susceptible to oxidation. That means NO gas, when it leaves the water layer, come across with the oxygen in the atmosphere, it will be further react and oxidized to form NO2. Okay? Can you see it clearly? Maybe I use the um, deeper blue color. So this is not balanced. If you want to balance, just put two and two here. Um, the key is, this one is colorless, but this one is brown, okay? So that's why <coughs> when the NO, nitrogen monoxide, leave the water layer, and it oxidizes into brown nitrogen dioxide, and therefore resulting in this uh, brown layer of gas, okay? Bear this in mind, this is NO2, not NO. <clears throat> so there are a lot of observations you have to mention. Huh? At least uh, I can tell there are three observable change. Three observable change. Now for concentrated nitric acid, um, it is also an oxidizing agent, even stronger oxidizing agent. So um, if you look at the reaction, you see the only difference between the one with dilute nitric acid is the product. It's the product. It's the product. Can you see the difference? So, uh, we say that because concentrated nitric acid is even more oxidizing than dilute nitric acid. So, before it forms nitrogen monoxide first and then the nitrogen monoxide slowly oxidized to form nitrogen dioxide right it, it kind of separated into two steps but with a very strong oxidizing agent such as concentrated nitric acid it makes things complete in one step basically it oxidized into sorry it reduced into nitrogen dioxide right away. So you can tell is, um, in fact, once it produces nitrogen monoxide, it immediately oxidizes that nitrogen monoxide into NO2, even without the NO uh, 
comes in contact with the oxygen. Okay? So I repeat, the nitric acid, once it undergoes re reduction, it first gives you NO gas, but since concentrated nitric acid is so oxidizing that once the NO being produced, it is immediately oxidized into NO2. So that's why you use, we use one chemical equation to show that it forms NO2 right away. Okay, right away. Okay. Now, uh, if you check the oxidation number, this is positive 5, this is positive 4. Okay. Now, you, you may think, I, I'm not sure if you have this misconception, uh, you may think, oh, if I look at the oxidation number, hey, nit dilute nitric acid, a positive 5 to a positive 2. Uh, like, like 3 electron transfer. Yeah, positive 5 to a positive 4, only like 1 electron transfer. So does it mean that dilute nitric acid is a stronger uh, oxidizing agent than concentrated one? Um, no, we don't talk about it like this. How many electron transfer does not relate to how strong it is? Bear this in mind. So it could be just one electron transfer, but still being very, very strong oxidizing agent. An example would be like uh, potassium. Potassium, you can tell, is a very, very strong reducing agent because it loses that electron very readily, right? So, but you won't say that potassium, oh, only one electron transfer, so, so kind of weak. No, 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 you don't talk about this. It's two different stories. The amount of electron transfer depending on the outermost shell electron. How much electron does it require to achieve an octet structure? As to the oxidizing power and stuff, um, it is related to the uh, electrochemical series, which you, we will talk about it in a few pages later. Um, it's kind of experimentally determined. So anyway, there, are, there is no relationship, right? Just have to um, sort this out before you, um, you know, stir up confusions. Um, go, go to the uh, diagram here. Now you can tell the reaction immediately produced very dense brown fume on the top of the solution because it produced NO2 gas right away. So it should be much more browner, uh, much more browner, browner than, than the, the, the one with dilute nitric acid, okay? Okay, so down here is kind of uh, some uh, summary of what we have talked about. So you see dilute and concentrated nitric acid, they react similarly except the concentrated nitric acid, concentrated nitric acid, reacts much faster because of being a stronger oxidizing agent and also because of the higher concentration, it has a greater frequency of collision, right? So, and it also produces NO2 directly, produces NO2 directly. So these are the two difference, and also, the, the, of course, the chemical equation is different. When it comes to observation, they actually have very similar observation. It's only as a matter of speed, as a matter of reaction rate. Reddish brown solid slowly dissolves. Um, solution turns blue. Uh, brown gas is produced, uh, but depending on which one, the concentrated one is faster, denser, with more brown fume. Okay. So that is the reaction. So this one is very important, very frequently asked. So probably um, as, as important as the concentrated sulfuric acid with copper. So I'll put a huge star here to, to, to emphasize it. Okay. Now, okay. <clears throat> if you look at B here, reaction of nitric acid and other oxidizable. So again, some other reactions that probably you have an idea. For this one, I don't think you really have to memorize it, but at least you know there is a reaction. Um, right. So, it's not really important. I'll put it here. So, uh, these are the concentrated nitric acid. So, you can see all the, all the products are NO2. All the products are NO2, no doubt. Um, Depending on what, uh, carbon, sulfur, they will all oxidize to SO2. Um, this is sulfite. Sulfite is also a very common reducing agent. It will oxidize to sulfate. Okay? So, um, not very important, so you guys can look at it by yourself. 
Now, lastly, I, I understand, like very complicated, like concentrated sulfuric acid, concentrated nitric acid, or even concentrated hydrochloric acid, maybe you guys kind of uh, find it difficult to, to find the comparison. So I, I have uh, tabulated uh, a lot of things here. So it's a, basically a comparison, look at the chemical formula. Um, so I only outline some of the important things that I haven't mentioned. So for example, the uh, boiling point and volatility. Now, these are all relative speaking. We say that uh, sulfuric acid is exceptionally non-volatile, exceptionally non-volatile, and uh, has a higher uh, boiling point. Now the reason is because uh, sulfuric acid is basically uh, uh, no water, basically no water. It's just HSO4. And you know that for HSO4, if you um, draw is um, is a uh, is a uh, structure. In fact, it can form extensive hydrogen bond. Right, with these two hydroxyl groups, right, it can form extensive hydrogen bond. So that means it has a very high boiling point and unlikely to uh, become gas. So that's that is the reason why when compared to two, when compared to the two other acid. Um, observation when standing air, um, because this is not volatile, so sulfuric acid does not really, um, well, it will absorb water because remember it has a high hygroscopic property, it will absorb water and dilute itself, but you don't really see an observation. But for the remaining two, uh, HCl, because it is highly volatile, the HCl gas, uh, when it's formed, you can see some steamy mist okay for nitric acid there will even be some uh, reddish brown fume because uh, the nitric acid may react with the air because it's such a strong oxidizing agent so it may react it, will, it may uh, oxidize some of the things in the in the air uh, so that it will become no2 okay Decomposition by light, it is the only case for nitric acid, and that's why nitric acid should be stored in a brown reagent bottle. Okay? It was asked before in the certificate level, uh, not sure about DSC though. Um, property, property other than being acidic, uh, you see hydrochloric acid, even concentrated one, only exhibit uh, uh, acidic property. Sulfuric acid, bunch of different properties. Nitric acid, mostly oxidizing. Now here, it was kind of uh, mentioned in form four, but not in detail. It's about the corrosive nature, like what properties of the acid contribute to the corrosive nature. Now corrosive means it damages, it damages our skin, it damages the floor, damages object. But what properties? accounts for is damage. Now for hydrochloric acid, it is simply because of the high concentration of H+, but for sulfuric acid, it is most related to the dehydrating and oxidizing property. Dehydrating property, they remove water from the, from the compound of the cell of our skin. Therefore, it damages our skin when it touches on us, on the skin of course. Um, nitric acid, oxidizing. So oxidizing, they basically damage, again, our body tissue, okay, by a chemical reaction. Uh, reduction half equation, you can read it yourself. Um, reaction with copper, we often compare. Uh, bear this in mind, uh, reaction with copper for this one, it requires heating. Heating, requires heating, otherwise no reaction, okay? So that's it for the uh, very hardcore content. Like you really have to uh, go over it yourself a couple of times, do some practice, and um, try to get to try to be more familiar with it. Okay. Now I will pause this video right now. It's because it's getting lengthy. Um, on the next part, perhaps you guys may need to take a break, go through the things that I've discussed, and for the next video, we will look at the two practice questions on twenty-four and uh, 25, okay?
So I'll pause it here for a while.